Hey everybody, Dave here from Dave Tries to Fix Stuff, channel dedicated to the repair, restoration, and resurrection of broken stuff. Uh, today's episode, we are going to be concentrating on this amplifier right here. This is a, uh, a late 50s, I believe like a 1959 Airline 8503, um, which has is in decent shape. It's seen better days, but there's definitely some little issues with it in, in the respect of uh, finish. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, had this amplifier for close to a year now. I actually serviced it right after I got it and um, got got it working again um, to where it, it actually plays pretty decent right now. But um, there are still a couple little things that I'm going to do to it um, to improve the sound. Um, also, I'm going to be concentrating on getting this cabinet uh, fixed up. I'm going to try to get all this uh, Tolex and stuff reattached. Uh, get it cleaned up as much as I can, get the corners uh, fixed up, all that good stuff, you know, try and make it look pretty. I've got parts of the airline logo that go down here into these little holes. Uh, it's a piece of plastic that gets put down in there, but it's been broken up into parts, and I've only got parts of it. We'll see if we can get that thing somehow um, re, uh, reattached, you know, put back together and working. If not, I might have to, they have some aftermarket ones I found that are really expensive, but... Either way, we'll try and get that uh, reattached somehow <clears throat> and get this looking as good as we can and sounding as good as we can. And uh, if you uh, are interested in sticking around and seeing if I can uh, get all that stuff accomplished, please join me. Okay, first thing we're going to do on this is I'm going to get a, a baseline, <clears throat> um, baseline uh, tone samples from it. Um, it's got two channels. I'll go into that in a little more depth in just a second here. Uh, two channels that are identical as far as the circuit is concerned. I don't know how they sound separate. It's been a long time since I've played this thing. I don't know how they sound uh, separate from each other, but we'll go into both channels. Um, each channel has two inputs and there's a tremolo circuit and all that. And each channel has a tone and, and volume control, obviously. So um, I've got my daughter's uh, Hello Kitty guitar here that we will use to uh, to test it. Let's see here. Turn up the volume a little bit. Turn up the tone a little bit. We'll get a good bass line. Oh my goodness. Let me tune this real quick. I'll be right back. Okay, hopefully no more of that embarrassing stuff. If you put it at about at about 12 o'clock, it's got a, a nice, you know, just barely overdriven, overdriven tone. Um, I'm gonna crank it a little bit more. This thing does, if I remember correctly, does tend to get just a little bit farty when it, it gets a little bit higher up. So I'm not sure if that's just gonna be some tone shaping or what. Yeah, that's just, that is getting just a just a touch on on the fizzy side. up there so let's try the other channel and see if there's any real difference definitely got some noise there now <clears throat> One thing I can I kind of notice on this right away is the fact that it, it not only is getting a little bit fizzy, but um, it, it does get a little fizzy and farty. If, what I noticed on the, on the um, schematic that the voltage going to the first gain stage on both of these channels is only like 90 volts, which is not, not very high, and I'm thinking that's kind of um, contributing to the fizziness on this. And that's one of the things we're going to be looking at. So um, let's we'll get the thing turned around, and we'll look at the uh, the chassis and uh, and see what everything looks like, and we'll we'll uh, we'll go from there. 
All right, so we've got the top uh, chassis section here. Obviously shows airline model 8503. Uh, we have our two channels, two inputs each. There, uh, there's also a model 8504 that is the exact same circuit. The only difference is that that one has three inputs per channel as opposed to the two. Uh, funny thing is that there's no difference between the channels, between the, the inputs on these channels. There's no difference between the channels either, as I will show in the schematic in just a little bit. Um, so you basically have six inputs of the exact same thing. So I don't know why they ever made the 8504, but they did. Maybe just perceived value was kind of the, the reasoning for it. But um, anyway, you can see here volume on the insides it's not like they have volume tone volume tone the volumes are on the inside the tones are on the outside which is strange and then over here you've got the speed and strength for your uh, your tremolo and you can hear that too it's getting some static when I touch this stuff so I'm gonna have to check that out I did a, I did a full service on this thing before but it's been sitting pretty much by itself ever since so but the top chassis is attached to the bottom chassis through this bundle of wires here which connects to a socket down behind the rectifier tube and that rectifier tube is hot I still have it on obviously um, but what we have is obviously we've got a, a 6x5 rectifier tube here uh, the two power tubes are 6v6s um, this little guy is the tube used for the uh, tremolo it is a 6au6 and then down here we've got the uh, an AA 12 AX7 that is this is a third stage and the phase inverter which might have something to do with the noise we're going to have to clean out the sockets there again and then hanging up here in the first chassis is the other 12 AX7 that's the first stages for the two uh, the two channels there but um, one thing I'm going to have to do with this obviously not one thing a lot of the things I'm going to have to do are going to be regarding cleaning this all out um, getting the chassis cleaned up and and you know re-glued put back together it's not a cardboard chassis as is typical with you know the Valco style amps um, of the day it's like a composite material in here and you know this is a, a high pressure laminate board um, nothing you know it's basic construction like you'd normally see on on these types of amps of, at this of, of this age, uh, the code right there is, for the speaker is a 285 844. Um, I'll have to look up 285. I'm not up on my codes for speakers, but the 844 that is the 44th week of uh, 1958. This speaker though is not the original speaker. Um, I bought this amplifier from a guy off of Craigslist for. Um, a, a pretty good price. The, the problem that he had with it, he said he was the original owner, or that his father or uncle was the original owner, and they passed it down to him, and then when he had it, he blew the original speaker. Um, and the speaker that he had put in it is actually the speaker that is now in that speaker cabinet right there, um, which is actually a good speaker. It's an early 70s speaker, but the magnet on it and the, the entire uh, frame on it was huge. So when he put it in there, this uh, chassis would no longer fit so his answer to that was to disconnect the four bolts that were holding it on and then he shifted the entire chassis out so that the back holes on the chassis he would bolt to these holes right here and the chassis would just sat halfway out exposing all of the circuitry underneath to, to the to the you know whoever wanted to stick their fingers up there and get electrocuted so Obviously, when I got that, that, I figured that was not a smart idea. So I had this, just happened to have this speaker, um, which I had uh, gotten in for, a really, I saw it on eBay for a really good price. Um, and knew that it would fit very well with this particular amp because it was period correct. So I put that in here and I was able to get everything shifted back in and, and, and put back in place. I still have to find some bolts for the other side which will be part of this project as well but the general idea is going to be to clean everything up um, get the Tolex reattached get the Tolex I'm gonna to try and some methods on dyeing the Tolex like on the on the corners where it's been faded away um, maybe even do the same type of stuff on 
the parts where it's been chewed away. I mean, I'm going to re-glue all this stuff too to, to get it flattened back down, but the places where there is no Tolex, I'm going to try to dye or somehow color or paint that to get it to kind of match the color of the Tolex again so that these areas where it's all torn away are, are not nearly as, uh, as prevalent or as noticeable. Um, just to kind of get it, you know, prettied up. I'm going to try to clean up all this stuff. I'm going to get all these little, um, all the nuts on here on all of these are, uh, covered in rust. I'm going to take those off and get some rust remover. Even if it, it might turn them black and if it does, so be it. I'd rather have them look black, um, from that than have them look rusty, but I'm going to get all the rust removed, get everything cleaned off as well as possible, uh, taking care not to mess up any of the silk screening that's on here uh, and then like I said I'm gonna be um, doing some modifications to the circuit to help to improve the sound um, and to explain what I'm gonna do on that we will go to the schematic now okay so here we have the schematic um, again it is a Ward's airline model. This is, says GDR 8503A and 8504A, but it is the 8503 and 8504. Um, again, the only difference between the 8503 and 8504 are the number of inputs on it. Um, as you can see on this one, zoom in a little bit there, get this lined up a little better. Um, this one shows the three inputs per channel here. Mine only has two. Now, if you'll notice on this thing too, let me get my pointer out here. Um, these things, these two channels coming in here are exactly the same going all the way through their volume pots, tone pots, volume pots, until they connect to this right here, which in turn goes down to here and then connects to the what is the second stage, depending on you know, well, it's the second stage regardless, you know, because you have one stage here for the one channel, one stage here for the other channel, goes down into the second stage here and then into the phase inverter. So there is absolutely no difference in tonal qualities between the two of them. Um, obviously, since these are in phase, you can plug into one of them with your instrument and then do a patch cable from the second or third jack here, plug it into the other channel and then run these in parallel, which I've done before. But the fizziness and the fartiness that I get now in plugging into just one of the channels is exemplified by doing that. Um, now, I don't want to say that I don't think this sounds good because I think this sounds really good. This is a really nice sounding amp provided you keep the volume at a reasonable level and not, and not go too far. But, um, I mean, this, this actually, this whole schematic here is a is the exact same schematic, exact same circuit as the Silvertone 1784. Um, the only difference, I think, is the rectifier on this one's a 6x5, and the one on the Silvertone is a 6x4, which is essentially almost identical um, uh, data sheets. You know, it's specs on, on the two amp, or the two tubes, I'm sorry, just completely different um, pinouts on it. That's the only real difference. And everything else is, there might be one or two components that have very, very slight differences here and there, but the actual components throughout the entire signal chain going through here are all exactly the same. So, and, and the 1784 is known for being a really cool sounding amp, and this, this one's no different. Um, but the fact that I do have two identical channels, my plan is to keep one of them stock and then on the other one, make a few changes to try to clean up some of the problems that I'm hearing in the other amp, namely being able to turn it up past a certain, you know, um, volume and having it getting farty. Um, like I said, as you can see right here, this has, zoom in just a touch, this has uh, a voltage of 90 volts right there. And trying to get this thing to stay in place sorry this shows 90 volts again that, I mean that's not super duper low but it is low enough to where I think that's what's causing some of the um, distortion in the signal is, is the low voltage and that is in turn creating that farty sound um, 
the reason that's that low is because of that resistor right there, which is at 330K. I think I might actually try to go as low as 100K on that. I can try a couple of different values and see what it sounds like, but that is the the what I'm going to do. You know, the other thing I'm going to do too, and actually the first one I'm going to make, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here because the first uh, change I'm going to make is to this one on the second uh, second stage. This 330 um, resistor is controlling, is dropping the voltage to this, and that's at 125. If I can raise that up a little bit too, I think that will will make a big change. So probably the first change I'm going to make is I'm going to try some different values in here and go through the channels, play it a little bit, and see if that clears up a little bit of the fartiness. Hopefully that'll help. Um, I'll, I'll do what I can with that, and then I will go up to these these guys right here. I may even change the values on both of them just a little bit just to clear up the fartiness just a touch, but that that is a big maybe. I'll do it on the first one, and then we'll concentrate on the, the mods on the, on the second channel, and if everything sounds good, maybe we'll play around with the, the first channel a little bit. And I know there's people out there, and, and I'm kind of the same way. I, I think it's almost sacrilegious to modify um, circuits like this, but if they're if they're vintage circuits. But like I said, when I've got two channels that are the exact same uh, sound, what what's the point of that? There's no point in that to me. I don't see a reason to have. I'm playing one guitar through it, so. I would rather have something I could I could choose from to kind of get some different tones and then a little more dynamics to the circuit. So I'm still leaving one that's going to sound perfectly stock and perfectly like it does, you know, normally. Um, but the other one I'm going to play around with and, and try to make it sound better. So that's what we're looking at, and uh, that's what we're going to move forward with now. Okay, so I got the um, chassis out. Both chassis are out right now. Um, Again, obviously they're put together like this. Um, I started to clean this off a little bit and figured probably be better to document what it looks like. So I really didn't clean it all that much when I had it last time. So I did. I just cleaned off the top a little bit. But I am going to try to get as much of this. You know, I don't know how well that's going to show up on camera, but there is a some oxidation, a little bit of rust, and all that. I'm going to try and get that cleaned up as much as possible off of this thing. Um, if I flip it over, you can see. The servicing I did from it, I replaced the this I believe these right here I think were um, use my pointers. Sorry about that. I know you probably just I just banged through the microphone on that. Um, these right here I believe were from a multi-section uh, capacitor that was in here. Maybe although I mean it looks like it's got these, so maybe not. These might have been just on, on their own. This one might have been a multi. And that was on its own. I don't remember. It's been, like I said, it's been all C year anyway. So, but I did replace those. Obviously, I replaced this one way over here. This uh, um, bypass capacitor that is on the, I think that's on the third stage. I'm sorry, the second stage. I mean, I have to look at the thing, the schematic again. But I do believe. Let's see, what is that? What have I got here? So one, two, three. Yeah, that's that's the third pin. So that's going to be the the AX7. That'll be the second stage. So that's going to be the bias resistor and the uh, bypass capacitor on that. So um, and then you know obviously I replaced all these coupling caps. Um, this one, what one was that? Where did I have that going to? This one was part of the. Looks like it was part of the. Uh, tremolo circuit in some way, which that's what these are right here. I use those for. The only reason I use those as opposed to um, these right here is that I think I ran out of um, the red film capacitors when I was doing this, so I had these little faux Mallory. Maybe those might be real Mallory's, I don't know. But uh, I had those on in stock. I also had this orange drop already in my stuff. I have since replenished all my capacitors to have a you know a nice stash to work from but at the time I think I was low on them so that's why I used that but I did the uh, the service on this which I think most of this is going to be in good shape I don't I don't see any reason to think that the stuff that I did before would be any kind of a problem 
but uh, again this is going to be about trying to play with some of the values in here to get it to uh, improve its tone. Um, you can also see that over here I removed the original two prong plug and put in a three prong and grounded it right here. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's what we have to work with right now. Um, and then up here is where you've got your first, this is where the tube goes for the first uh, stages for both channels. And this is what we're going to have to pull out of here as well as probably, oh, I, th I think I may have changed these out too. In fact, I think I did change these out. I don't recall. But um, yeah, I did because I could see I think I cut that right there. I just cut the leads on the other ones and Jay hooked them in there. So, um, but I'm not going to mess with those this time anyway. So I'll take the, I need to take this guy out right here. And if I remember correctly, there's stuff like looped all around here. So it makes it kind of difficult to, to deal with as far as changing stuff out. But this is definitely the location we're going to have to get into to start playing with other values. So that's what we're going to, we're going to do is I'm probably going to remove all the stuff from this chassis. So I can, first of all, do a better job of cleaning all the pots out. Uh, cleaning all the um, jacks and all that good stuff and just making it to where it'll be uh, easier to work with. The thing is, is all these wires right here that are going through here that go through this thing obviously go and hook up to this. So it's not like I'll be able to easily, I'm, I mean I can back this thing back into the hole to give myself some slack, but I won't be able to, unless I desolder all this stuff, which I don't necessarily want to do. Um, it might be, it's just going to be working around that mess. So, all right. So, um, I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm probably going to try and clean some of this up and see if I can find some dates on any of this so I can get a, an accurate date on, on this thing. So let, let me do that real quick and see where we are. All right. Now in trying to find some dates on these things, the first one I show here is 092F. That's the only one I see on the output transformer. Oops, sorry. Um, on, the, uh, on the other transformer, the power transformer, right here, I see what looks like a P92F, which makes sense if it was a set with this other one. With, you know, O92F, so O would be the output, and then P would be power. 92F, and th but then it says 572. Um, so if that's the date code, and this shows as like, you know, June of 72, because there's not a 72nd week in a year, so it wouldn't be, you know, something like that. I'm wondering if maybe this is a set that, because this guy did tell me that he, he it was the early 70s that he blew the speaker in this thing and changed it out. I'm wondering if he might have changed out the set of... Uh, of transformers too. I, I, I'm not sure, but that is uh, that's the date on those. But let's see. Looking at this guy, let's see if we can get that to focus in. You can see right there that number. Let me get this a little more. So that number right there is 6009 so that is the ninth week of 1960 so I think this is and they all say uh, similar dates let's see 6609 6609 yeah these all say 6609 on them we're looking at uh, at a late 50s or very early 60s amplifier here so either way um, looks good to me I, I I gotta say because of when these were made and the style of this thing I want to say it's a 59 because every other one I've seen that looks like this is a 59 but it, it could be a 60 who knows I'm gonna continue to say it's a 59 just because that's cooler to me <laughs> so um, all right so let me uh, get to the point where I start uh, digging into the stuff up in this one because there's really not much we have to do with this. You know what? That's not true. The very first one I have to do is in this. So I need to find that first um, resistor going to the plates on this tube. And I need to 
take that take that out, hook it up to the, to the decade box, and see if it makes any difference in you know the the gain or you know just the overall tone structure of this thing. See what happens with that. So let, let's do that first. Okay, so I tested a few different values um, in that first. Um, I'll show you where it is. Turn this down. I tested a few values in this um, resistor location. This is the um, plate resistor for the second phase, and I actually uh, tested a few values in my decade box and. I did in fact change this out to a 100k so that's allowing for a little bit more gain um, in the circuit not so much um, distortion but gain so it does make it a little bit louder now that does make it to where it allows the amp to be able to push the um, power tubes a little more so it probably it is it's kind of trading out a little bit of gain from the second stage for a little more gain in the power, uh, the power state or the power amp. So, you get the idea, though. So, that is allowing just a little bit more. Um, it's allowing a little bit more gain to come through, so it's pushing the power tubes a little bit more. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, digging into what's uh, up in the preamp section a little more, uh, or the, you know at least the first uh, gain stages on this thing, and see what I can get uh, by working on that. So we'll be right back. You know, so one thing I want to do here um, is I want to check. Voltages. I, ha I haven't actually done that. You know, I need to put this tube back in here too. I need to verify that what I'm going to be doing here is actually going to improve anything because if I have voltages that are um, already, you know, higher than what they say on the schematic, I don't want to get these things too far out of spec or start making them weird. So. That's 40 volts. Wow. That's uh, probably not what I want it to be, is it? Let's put it up to there. Yeah, 40 volts is uh, way low. This thing shows it should be 90, yeah, 90 volts on the first. Let me, um, where's the other one? one's way on the other side, isn't it? What am I getting coming into this thing? Two hundred and forty eight volts coming in. <laughs> Holy crap, so what's my voltage drop there? Voltage drop of hundred and seventy one volts, so there's no way that's a three hundred let me turn this off real quick and then I'm going to measure this thing this should be 330k let's see where it comes in at because that's I don't know if this thing it was originally well let's see this was the This one here, like I, I suck at color codes, but this one right here, which is what orange is that orange, brown, and yellow, orange, 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 red, and yellow. But the thing is, is that I'll measure this one too. This one right here is the one that I pulled out of the first first mod I did, and it looks like it's orange, orange, yellow, or it's orange. The middle line is kind of faded out a little bit, but looks like orange, orange, yellow, which is that one too. And so that should be. I really need a freaking color chart, man. I really suck at doing these, at, at these color things. So, but let's uh, tell you what. 
I'll put this onto this guy and we'll measure this one and see what we get. Yep. 300. So that this one is is in spec. This one on the other hand that is in place. Oops. Let's see if I can get that back on there without killing anybody, including myself. And this one is coming in at like 1.7 megs. So this one is obviously way too big. So. Um, and lowering lowering the voltage down on this thing to 40 volts is way not way not in specs. Okay, so I got this thing out, and as you can see, the um, resistor that is in place for this first channel is still it's still drifted high. Um, actually, it's drifted out of spec. Um, if it's supposed to be a 10%, it shouldn't be any higher than like, you know, 360. So it is a little high. So I'm going to change this one out too, but I will change this one back to a 330 because that's what this one should be. Um, but the other one, since it is the one that's really out of spec, I think that's the one that we will probably uh, mess around on the values with just a little bit. Okay, so right now I've got... Um, a couple of things changed out on this. Right now, I don't have the first channel hooked up. I had to disconnect it. That's the one that's going to stay stock anyway. I had to disconnect it because um, I couldn't work on this thing. It was too tight. Uh, plus, I have a... This is going to, I believe, this lug right here. So that's going to have to be replaced. But in the meantime, um, this is the 330K um, resistor that was originally out of spec. I replaced it with a film or not a film, a uh, metal resistor, or maybe it is film metal. I, uh, God, it's been a long day. Um, so this first channel on this side is is basically at this point stock. Um, you can see I also right here I changed out the um, capacitor and I did the same thing with some capacitors underneath here the last time I serviced it. I forgot to point that out earlier, but. There were capacitors that were changed in this too because I, I just changed all the caps out because I think they're all like old, uh, what are they called, the Sangamos, which are not very good capacitors. So, um, But in right here in the plate resistor for the second channel, I have lowered to 100K and this is the bias resistor for that same channel. I've lowered that to 820 ohms, 820 ohms. All right, so I've got everything uh, um, mounted back into the chassis. I ended up putting in a 22 microfarad uh, bypass capacitor um, right down here. So let me kind of bend that down a little bit so it gives a little bit of room um, right there across that um, across that bias resistor. Um, gave it a little bit more meat in this channel. I've actually been kind of going between the two channels a little bit to see what I think sounds better. Um, one of the things, oops, sorry, I keep hitting the camera. Sorry about that. Um, go back right here where we can see. One of the things that I'm looking at, these two um, 330K resistors here, these are, uh, they're not really grid stoppers per se, I mean they kind of are, but they're, I mean, they're actually in the preamp thing. The grid stoppers usually do and grid leaks usually go right before the um, the grid itself. So if I was going to put them in, I'd want to put them in as close to this grid as possible. These things are not only in this other section here, but they go to a um, shielded cable that goes down, gets connected into an input jack and then goes in here. So. They're really not doing a whole lot um, other than just attenuating the the signal itself. Um, and I've got it plugged into the, the channel that is still stock. But in listening to it, 
I've got it about halfway up right now. Let's see. Halfway up and tone just a little past a little past noon because I'm actually doing this kind of a double here, you know, let's do this way. Let's back that off. I'll put it back on signal coil. Now, if I take a alligator clip and I bypass that, granted it's noisy because of everything that I have here, but try it again and hear what it sounds like. It's got a lot more punch. Um, obviously it's brighter it's it sounds a shitload better than with that 330k in there and I'm really convinced or I'm convincing myself that I may actually bypass these just jumper these things I may just put in a um, a couple of uh, pieces of wire between here and just hook them up directly because I think it's a waste to to it's really shunting the signal and not it's not shunting but it's it's attenuating the signal to the point where it it kind of muddies it let's try it over here on one of these guys turn this guy back down turn this guy up to about half this guy's up to about half so these are both at the tone and volume are both at about 12 o'clock oops need to turn it up not sound bad at all that's a, that's a rocking amp right there I'll tell you what that's got a great sound to it almost you know I mean I've the the front end is a lot more like a, an old baseman or you know like an old uh, Marshall Marshall JTM early you know the kind of that they copied the basement off of and uh, I, I think this thing sounds killer right now so <laughs> It's not sounding bad at all, so I'm pretty happy with this. So actually, before I get this uh, chassis and stuff set aside, um, it hit me that I was doing all of the uh, samples and stuff, or all the testing through my test speaker over there. So I actually have everything uh, hooked up to the cabinet itself. Um, because I want to see what the voicing is going to be on that speaker. The one on my test speaker, my test cabinet, has a much bigger magnet than this one does. So I think that's going to be able to um, handle a lot more, you know, uh, uh, wattage, and, and it'll respond differently to the the um, overdrive and all that kind of stuff. So look at that. That's something I need to clean off. Yuck. Uh, anyway, so I got this plugged back into here. We're going to try a couple different things too. So let's see. So we're going to put volume, tone, put volume up to mid. Woo! That's hot and that's loud.
that's going to, uh, that might actually blow that speaker if that's done for too long at that one, so. <laughs> Jazz, this thing's vibrating the table so much that the chassis is actually moving itself off the table. So this thing is friggin' loud. It's actually kind of overpowering that. So I think it's probably better if on the modded channel, I actually leave the 330 in there, the 330K in there. see how long this video is getting and I think I'm gonna break it up into a couple of different videos um, this one we will just have this concentrate on the overview of the amplifier as well as the uh, as the actual modifications to the circuit um, this will be part one uh, in part two it will I will show the um, the cabinet the restoration of the cabinet and then uh, part three will be a couple of other things that uh, we'll add on to the end. So I uh, just want to say thanks for watching the video. Make sure you hit subscribe, uh, click like if there's anything you see that I did wrong or uh, any suggestions that you have, by all means, please leave a comment and uh, I will see you in the next video. Thanks a lot.